I had two other dogs, Rupert and Ollie. I had them from puppyhood, and they were raised with Cameron, my son. We were a pack, the four of us. Cameron passed Ollie, died a couple of years after Rupert. My core family had gone. I don't feel joy anymore. My joy was sharing this life with my son. And when he took his last breath, that breath carried my joy. I had never thought about having an assistance dog. I contacted my doctor because I've had multiple back surgeries and severe nerve damage in my leg. I was struggling a bit with mobility. And plus, I have been diagnosed with a complex post-traumatic stress disorder. My doctor and my psychologist both said, yes, you qualify for a service dog. They wrote letters, almost like a, a prescription. That's how the journey began. just went to look at puppies. Stanley was the first one I saw. I said, what's your name, little pup? And he spread himself out, flat as can be, front paws out, back paws out. It's called spluting when they do that. And they chin down, and he looked up at me, and he said, flat Stanley, nice to meet you. Whenever I'm out of the house, it's the most necessary. I've fallen before because my leg just disappears. Since that time, I've noticed that he has been more sensitive. Huh? Just going for a walk. He always stays on my left side because that's my weak side. And so he knows. He always crosses over to the left. He never crosses to the right, which is great. And that's something just by, just by doing, he's learned. He doesn't ever pull. I don't go for long hikes because I can't overdo it. But if I'm going for a short walk or a short hike, and there happens to be a hill up or down, he'll provide the extra pull on his lead to give me that little extra boost up. Yeah, we did it! <laughs> when he was four months old, I took him to the supermarket. And we were standing in line waiting to check out the groceries. And he was sitting next to me very nicely. The woman was checking out my groceries. And all of a sudden, he leaned all of his body weight into my leg. And at first I thought, oh, he's bonding. But then I was overcome with this feeling of anxiety. And I didn't even know how to describe it. I had never felt anything like it. I felt like I had to get out of there. I felt profoundly sad. 
and I was start to sweat and I had a stomach ache and my hands were sweaty and I asked the lady to please hurry up, I had to go. And so she finished up and I went outside, sat on, on a bench and cried and cried and I didn't know why. As I was sitting there, he kept wanting to jump up on my lap. And he jumped up on my lap and he pressed his body into my heart. And I just sat there and I held him and I cried. And then I realized later what it was. It was the rhythmic beeping of the scanning of my groceries sounded a lot like the rhythmic beeping of the monitors in the hospital. And I spent months and months in the hospital with him, helpless to do anything for him. I just had to sit there and wait and watch. And it was the beeping that triggered me. And that moment where he leaned into me, which grounded me so I could get through that trigger, again, is something I could not have trained him to do. It's something that he came with, that, that very sensitive impulse and connection to me. His work for me is our bond. And then being out in the world together, learning by doing. Sometimes the way that it manifests in me is that I'll get completely numb physically. I can't feel my face or my extremities. I, I can't, I just, I lose all feeling. And he'll be right by my side. Or he'll go and he'll get his toy and won't force me to play with it. And that pops me out of my mood, whatever spin I'm in. He can pop me out of it, unlike any person. He's always with me. He doesn't stay out for long. He comes back intermittently. You've seen that. I see you. Here he comes on the run. Good boy. So from an early age, I started taking him, socializing him with other dogs, with children, with older people. Also anti-socializing him at the same time. He needs to be comfortable around other dogs and other people, but he also needs to be aware that when his harness goes on, that he's working, and so he cannot be distracted. His energy completely changes, his posture changes, behind his eyes changes. He is focused, he is ready, and he's at work. He'll come up and pet him or want to pet him. He may acknowledge the person, but he doesn't focus on them. And that's his attitude. When I'm working, I'm working. Most of the time I'll say, you know, sorry he's working right now, but I appreciate the love and so does he. Exceptions that I make are very young children who don't know better. It's a moment to teach them about how do you approach a dog, how do you recognize a working dog, and when it's a working dog, you really must ignore them. Technically, they are essential medical equipment and must be treated as such when they're working. When he's home, he's free to be a dog, completely different dog. No less sweet, no less fun, and you know, his personality is the same, but his energy is completely different. No, I don't need it to. When we go to a restaurant, without my even telling him, he goes right under the table and lies down and he'll stay under the table until it's time to leave. I've never seen a dog sit through a play. There are loud noises. There's a battle happening on stage. People yelling and screaming or a gun going off. And he's totally chill because he's been raised in that environment. He knows the difference between something happening, actually a drama in life, and something that's on the stage. Sometimes I'll even sit on my lap and watch the play. And you can see his ears are up and he's watching the action and he's, you know, It took him about nine months before he ever barked. He doesn't bark much. Every moment is beautiful with him. He, he's changed the game for me in terms of how, how the rhythm of my days go. He will sleep until I wake up. And even if he's not asleep, he'll be silent and he'll curl up. Usually he'll curl up behind my knee or in the small of my back, his back to mine. It's usually how he sleeps. What I've given him is my attention and my instinct about what he's capable of. I knew it the moment I looked into his eyes. The older I get, 
the more I value my alone time. I also value an environment that's healthy for him. He's all those things you mentioned and more. He transcends a label. It's such a beautiful expression of what it feels like. It feels like I have an extension of my soul walking outside my body to help compensate for the things that my soul can't do on its own. I think that every disability is as unique as the person who experiences it. And so I think every service dog is unique to that person's experience with their disability and the needs that they have. I know a woman, for instance, who lost the use of her hands in a work accident. And her service dog had to go through a specialized training because it does everything for her. She has a, a rag on the handle of her um, refrigerator. The dog pulls open the refrigerator and gets things out and puts it on the counter. The dog closes the refrigerator, the dog opens doors. The dog makes her bed for her, pulls the sheets up, but all of it, and it puts the laundry in the washing machine. I mean, it's amazing what this dog can do. But it had to be trained to do those things, obviously, in a way that Stanley doesn't need to be trained. So I hope people do understand that, you know, they're not robots. They are medical equipment, but they're not robots. They, they have hearts and soul. And what's I? You do? Okay, here we go. Here we go. Thank you, Mark. Get set. <laughs> you ready? Go, 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 go. Oh my gosh, they would have adored each other. He, we, he grew up from womb to tomb in a house full of animals. He was surrounded by nature and built that connections. Cameron loved, loved, loved animals. When uh, I had to put Rupert, the 20-year-old dog, down, um, this was several years after Cameron passed, when they gave him Rupert the injection. And he was in my lap, and so I felt his spirit leave. Somewhere in the cosmos, I heard Cameron way in the back, going, <laughs> And I heard Rupert barking. It was like they were reunited and they were just like running through fields and, and it was a beautiful moment. It was, um, I still get emotional about that because I remember it so vividly. Part of me that's missing, Cameron, is my sense of direction. I don't remember how it came up in the conversation, but it was not long before he passed. I asked him, what do you, what do you think about heaven and hell, the whole idea of that? He said, Papa, I don't think it's a place you go after you die. I think it's a life you choose to live while you're here. You can choose to live a life that's heavenly or a life that's from hell. I said, can you give me a couple of examples? Like, who do you think lives a heavenly life? He said, well, we do, Papa. Here's a boy who's about to expire from cancer. And he believed that his life was heavenly. That moved me very deeply. We talked about people he saw who chose to live a hellish life. They were always complaining. They were never satisfied. They felt the world owed them something. And they made themselves miserable because they were stuck in their perspective. And I, I told him, I said, I absolutely agree with you. I think both heaven and hell are right here on earth, if we choose to see it. When he was seven, I can't remember what question he asked me, but it was a question he wasn't really the right age to hear the answer to. I said, well, we'll talk more about that when you grow up. He said, oh, Papa, I'm not going to grow up. He knew. Letting go of the things that no longer serve your life 
And sometimes they leave before we want them to. Cameron used to say, Papa, nobody has an expiration date on the bottom of their foot. We're all going to go. Some go younger, some go older, and that's the way it's been since the beginning of people. So there's another gift in the loss. If we choose to look at it that way, when we got his diagnosis, he did not have a moment of fear, of anxiety, of depression or rage, all of which he was certainly entitled to have. He knew by my being here that I was a survivor. He said, I want to survive this, but if I don't, I'm okay with that because I'll be able to help even more people. I'm just not anxious or anything. I'm not worried about if cancer takes my life because so I'll just be able to help people mentally and stuff physically. A few weeks after Cameron passed, I was feeling very frustrated because I, I couldn't go to the market without somebody falling apart in my arms. Cameron was beloved in our community. We were well known and well loved. And I was finding that soon after his passing, I was having to hold more people through their grief than I was being held in my own, even by myself. So I felt like I had to get out of town. And after being a superhero for two years, trying to save my son. I needed to get my scale back, my sense of scale. I was larger than life itself for two years. I needed to feel small. And the closest place I felt like I could go to feel that truly was the Grand Canyon. Unless you've been there, you have no concept of how vastly enormous it is. And there are these long stretches of desert between civilization and the Grand Canyon. And it was about three in the morning. The sky was inky black, and all you could see was the sky full of stars and the lights of the car on the road. Everything else around was black. It was surreal. And I'd been driving a long time. I needed a break. I saw a little pin light on the horizon. It seemed brighter and a different quality of light, so... I was hoping it would be a gas station or something where I could stop and get a cup of coffee. I ended up a couple of hours later at this place, and it was just three buildings with a huge hundred foot tall lamp post. And in the beam of light emitted by this lamp post was a small motel, nothing else for miles and miles around, but it had its own zip code. It had a post office. And I looked up at the post office, and it was called Cameron, Arizona. I'm not joking. I stayed overnight in the motel. I woke up around 9.30 or 10. I stepped outside. It was a beautiful, cloudless day, sunny. And there was a, a Native American elder sitting on her blanket selling the jewelry that she made. I bought this ring from her. She was in her 90s, probably. She had this leather skin from being out in the sun, thick, wrinkled, you know, beyond belief, tiny little slit eyes, long white hair, silvery white. And I knew she had some wisdom. And I asked her if I could sit down with her for a moment and ask her a question. And she invited me to sit. And I said, you know, I've, I've just recently lost my, my only child to brain cancer. And I'm struggling a bit, but I, I've been looking for a way to describe what I am now. A name, like widow or orphan. So that if someone says, oh, do you have any children? I can say, oh, no, I'm a blank. Enough said. But for those of us parents who have outlived our beloved children... We have no choice but to tell the story and to relive the loss over and over and over again. And so I said, is there anything in your tribal culture that holds this piece? She said, well, perhaps it's too profound a loss for a mere word to describe or identify. Don't ever let me go. You know, 
It's really important to keep your child's name in the world after they've passed. You rarely hear their name spoken again, even from family and friends. They won't speak his name. Now they must, because I've linked his name to mine. And that dash, that hyphen between Henry and Cameron bonds us together forever. My name is Henry Cameron now. But it's also an equation. It's the minus sign. It's Henry minus Cameron. Parenting is your compass. Even a broken compass can still work. It's never going to be whole. It's never going to be the same as it was. He could not have entered my life had that space been occupied. You create the space and you're authentic in that space and it's provided. So I can't look at my loss as a tragedy. I don't look at it as a comedy either, <laughs> certainly. I miss him, I miss his physical presence in the world. But I understand that we would not be having this conversation. We would not know each other had he not left the planet when he did. It would be a completely different journey had he stayed. Now, a lot of people have said to me, you know what, I think Stanley is Cameron reincarnated as a dog. Or some people say, he is so sent to you by Cameron. And it feels that way. He allows me, even as a lost traveler, to travel freely through the world, to be able to navigate physically this world, emotionally this world, which is in such chaos. The world has never not been in chaos. It's how we navigate through chaos. I had a great mentor one time tell me, if you just let go, realize that your body is designed in a way that allows you to float. Lay back, release your tension, and allow the water to carry you around the stones to a calmer place. Here's the rain. <laughs> I, I took that to heart. It's part of living in the moment. Always trusting that the water will carry you. you. Place the leaf in a stream, and you watch it go down the stream. And what happens? Is the leaf banging up against things? No. It's going all around all of the obstacles in its way, because it's just going with the flow. <laughs> He's the flow. Stanley is the flow. He allows me to flow through my life. He gives people permission to love. There's a magic that he has that allows love to flow freely like a leaf in a stream. So I'm just climbing the mountain every single day and I find absolute and utter delight in every corner I turn. And guess who pulls me up the mountain? Vlad Stanley. I wouldn't be able to get up the mountain without him. It's an alchemy of us that creates that special philosopher's stone. You're trying to tell me something. Do you want to go outside? I think what has replaced joy for me is deep satisfaction in being of service to other people. It's a sense of joy versus a feeling of joy. So in that Stanley is also exuberantly joyful as a being. I mean, he's the epitome of joy. I love you. I love you. I love you. Did you ever say I love you? <laughs>
each individual matters, each person, their time here in the physical matters profoundly. Don't you ever 